I want to speak to you from the subject eyewitness. Um, and I, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy. But before we get there, uh, let me just say that um, this, this incredible season of 2020 vision that we've been um, preaching from this year has been our theme. And it's really been something that has motivated us and really helped us to understand what it is that God is saying. And so as we were preparing for this Easter season, the theme eyewitness came and I've been studying it and thinking about it and mulling it over. And I tell you, I went through a, a, a series of mental uh, exercises trying to figure out what what does this mean and how does it apply to us here especially in this season that we're in with all of us being quarantined and social distancing and all of that and um, what I want to start with is just explaining to you that there's there was a great deal of research that has been um, brought to criminal justice systems um, about the importance of the personal characteristics and the validity of an eyewitness testimony. Now, this research on eyewitness testimonies, it began in the 1970s, but it really wasn't until the 1990s that the criminal justice system began to take the results of this validity of eyewitness testimony seriously. And what the thing, what, one of the things that they found in the 90s, even though this research had been going on since the 70s, once they, what they found in the 1990s was that, that amongst 100 people who were convicted of crimes prior to the advent of DNA forensic testing, that approximately 75% were the victims of mistaken eyewitness testimony mistaken eyewitness identification, 75% of the 100 cases. Now the problem still kind of exists now to this day because in many cases of crime, they don't have this DNA rich biological traces when at the crime scene. So we still very much so rely uh, on the eyewitness testimony in order to convict or to release somebody who is on trial. This is very interesting because in criminal cases, the validity of the eyewitness is critical because it can actually affect the life of the one who is on trial. Think about it. The validity of the eyewitness testimony is critical to the life of the one who is on trial. But in spiritual cases, you got to see that it is critical because it's not the eyewitness that is affecting the person on trial, but the very thing that you see affects your very life. It affects the very thing that God wants you to understand and what God wants you to see. So the eyewitness in a criminal case will affect the person who's on trial, but guess what? You're on trial <laughs> and you are the eyewitness that is being able to see what it is that God wants you to see so that you can move in the destiny that he has for you. Now, let's look at our scripture for this Easter season. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Hear all the twos, 2020, 20, 2 Timothy 2, 2. Here we go. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul is writing to Timothy, and this is what he says. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Let's start in verse 1. I'll start in verse 1. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses... And trust these to faithful men who will also, who will be able to teach others also. One more time. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So, here we have Paul saying this to Timothy. Now let's back up and let's talk about the history of the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul, we already know that he has been, uh, he's one of the key figures that is establishing the early church in the book of Acts. And I just want to put a plug in for all of you all who are watching that every Wednesday night we have started, we just started this last Wednesday where we're doing a virtual Bible study online. You can just download the app Zoom and uh, give us your, your email and we'll send you an invitation so that you can be a part of our virtual Bible study. And, uh, and so we, we were on 
Acts chapter 3 this past Wednesday. We're going to move on to Acts chapter 4 next Wednesday. So just the plug in for the virtual Bible study. But we know that in the book of Acts, and that's what we're studying, that Paul and Barnabas they were going around and establishing churches in different cities and different places. Now, one of the towns that they went to was a town called Lystra. This particular passage of scripture is found in Acts chapter 14, verse 8 through 20. Just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it to you. You can just read it on your own. So now in this town of Lystra, where Paul and, and Barnabas go, they actually heal a lame man. Think, hear this now, hear the story. Now, they go and this, heal this lame man, and all of the people in the town of Lystra are so impressed with Paul and Barnabas that they actually believe that they were gods, little gods incarnate. They believe that they were Zeus and Hermes. And so all the people of the town of Lystra, they come out and they start wanting to worship and they want to sacrifice to Paul and to Barnabas because they healed this lame man. And Paul has to stop them and say, hold on a second. Wait, 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 wait. What are you guys doing? Don't, don't worship us. We're not the ones. We're doing this because of Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who's working these miracles through us. And so what happens is that there are these other Jews that are from other towns, and they are upset. They're mad that Paul and Barnabas are there ministering the gospel. And so these Jews come into Lystra. They literally stone Paul and leave him for dead, okay? This is Paul's experience as he comes to this town of Lystra. He preaches the gospel. He heals a lame man. He gets stoned. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Anybody signing up for that? Leaves him for dead. Now, in this town of Lystra, there was this little boy named Timothy. Timothy was probably around at this time in which he watches these Jewish people go and stone Paul, basically run him out of town. They think he's dead. Paul gets up and he's able to go. He probably sees this crazy situation, this complete fiasco, and Timothy is, is, a, is a child that is growing up in this town. Now, let's talk about Timothy. Timothy is a very interesting character because he has a Jewish mother who has become a Christian. She has named the name of Christ, and his father was a Greek. So here you have this little boy who... Um, would be considered what they called back in those days a mumser, a half-breed. So he wasn't all the way Jewish. He wasn't all the way Greek. He was a half-breed. So this boy, Timothy, has this incredible legacy. The Bible talks about it. He has this incredible legacy from his mother, who is a Jew, but she is now a Christian, and she's this mighty, powerful woman of God. And not only was she a mighty, powerful woman of God, but her grandmother, her mother, Timothy's grandmother, whose name was Lois, was also a powerful woman of God. Now, you hear this Timothy boy is growing up in this town, Lystra. He has these incredible two women that are powerful women of God, but he's a half-breed. So when they go to the temple... Guess where Timothy is? Back at home. He loves God. He wants to serve God. He wants to have a relationship with God. But because of his, his upbringing and because of his status, <laughs> he was shut out of the things that would cause him to be able to grow in, into the things of God. So here's Timothy left at home, not being able to go to the temple like his mother and his grandmother, but he's saying to the Lord, he's like, but God, I love you. I, I love you. I want to serve you. I want to know you, but, but do you even see me? Do you even know that I exist? Do you even recognize that I matter to anyone? Here's the first point, y'all. <sighs> when we're asking God, do I exist? You have to understand that number one, that God is our first eyewitness. He's the one that sees us. He's the one that knows us. One of God's first names in the Bible is El Roy. And that word El Roy, that Hebrew name of God, means the God who sees me. God shows Timothy through Paul that I am the God who sees you. And my vision for you is 2020. I see you perfectly. I see you wholly. You may not be under.
understanding, and you may not be seeing, because come on, y'all, 75% of eyewitness testimonies are not even valid because they don't see what they're really supposed to see. But God is like, let me tell you something. I see you. I, you can't even be the witness until I'm your eyewitness. I see you. I see you and I know you. Look at, look at Psalms chapter 139. I'm going to read it to you in the Passions translation. I want you to know what God says about you. This is the Passion Translation, Psalms 139. Listen to these first five, five verses of it. It says, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You've perceived every movement of my heart and soul. And you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. You know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. Oh, my God. I'm telling you that's for somebody today. Let me read that one more time. This is verse 5 of Psalms 139. This is what the Lord says about you. He says, you, Lord, David says to the Lord, you, you have gone into my future and prepared the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. Somebody better take that and know that God says, I see you. Timothy is there in Lystra. He done watched Paul get tore up from the floor up. He's growing up in this, in this house where he wants to know God, but he's asking God, I know, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know you. But do you even see me? And God says, oh, yes, Timothy. Oh, yeah, I see you. Let me tell you how much I see you. I'm sending back Paul. Even though Paul got stoned and left for dead, Paul's coming back. You don't even know that yet. I got your, listen, I have your future laid out before you. <laughs> I have your future laid out before you. You don't even know that I'm working behind the scenes. He sends Paul back to Lystra to lay hands on this young man and to activate the gifts that are on the inside of him. Before we get to 2 Timothy 2, 2, we're going to get there, but let's first start at Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy. This is what he says to him in the first letter. Let's start at verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. This is Paul sending a letter to Timothy. Longing to see you, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. Here it is, verse 5. I am, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a, or the spirit of timidity, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or for me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. The father sent Paul all the way back to say, baby boy, I see you. I know the gift that's been in you. As a matter of fact, I laid my hands on you when you probably thought you were forgotten. You probably thought that nobody saw you. You thought that you were left for dead, that you were left out. You couldn't even go into the temple. The father says, I am your eyewitness. God sends Paul back to Lystra after he's been beaten and left for dead because there was a young man that God had been watching.
God has been watching you. Not with eyes of judgment, but with eyes of love and eyes of purpose, eyes of destiny and eyes of direction. Do you know that the 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the word ayin, A-Y-I-N. And the word actually means I, E-Y-E. It means God is always watching. You see, you may be like Timothy, where you're asking, does he even see me? Doesn't he even know that I am here? Does he know that I'm quarantined in the house with some people that may not be my favorite all the time? Can I get an amen? I mean, you know, we love our family. We don't always like them. <laughs> I'm funnier in person, trust me. And you may be asking, God, God, do you see me? Do you know that I'm here? I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, God, that I want my heart to be right. I want to have clean hands and a pure heart before you, but God, do you even see me? In 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, the eyes of the Lord are looking to and fro. He's waiting, he's looking for to give strength and to give direction and to give purpose to the hearts that are fully committed to him. Can I tell you something? God's watching, he's searching, he's looking. He is waiting for a heart that will be fully committed to him. All you have to do today is say yes. All you have to do to say is today is say, God, I, I, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to figure it out as I go along. And then God's saying, you don't have to do it on your own because guess what? I am your eyewitness. I'm watching you. I've been looking. I've been searching. And I'm going to send somebody back into your experiences, back into your town, back into your home, back into your life to re charge you, to rekindle the flame that's been inside of you. There's legacy that's been inside of you from generations before. You may not have even known you had a mama and a grandmama that was standing and loving God and, and serving God and praying for you even when you didn't even know how to pray for yourself. But just like Timothy, hmm, he's waiting to strengthen. He's waiting to bring proper vision to those whose hearts are fully committed to him. That's a word right now for a lot of people who are in, all of us are in quarantine. We're all social distancing. And, and I tell you, this week I have been, my heart has been burdened. I was praying with, um, with my sister the other day. She's one of my prayer partners and we were praying for this. And I was also sharing this with the intercessors as we are gonna begin to start praying every day at 12. And one of the things that's been a burden on my heart are the children that, have been, that are home. And not some, for some children, school is their safe place. For some children, school is the place where they find acceptance, love, meals, teachers that are happy to see them, smiles on their face. <gasps> I remember when I taught, I taught in the public school system for about five years when I was younger. And, and for some of those children, I remember that in, that, in that elementary classroom, I mean, they, they would come any way they could. They came dirty clothes. <laughs> they came uncombed hair. And I used to have lotion and deodorant and soap and toothbrushes and toothpaste in my desk, in my office, in, I mean, in my classroom, because for some of them, this was their first time that anybody cared enough to even brush their hair. So my heart's been burdened for these children, for some of these children that are home that, are, that may be neglected or may not be loved properly. They may not be accepted. They don't have people playing Uno cards with them and Uno and Monopoly and Trouble and let's make a puzzle, let's bake something together. Some children don't have that. And my heart is burdened. And I tell you, the Lord showed me so powerfully. I was praying earlier this week for all of those children and I saw the eye of God. He showed me his eyes and he says, Teresa, you keep praying because I'm watching them. I got my eye on them. They're not alone. They're not forsaken. They may be in broken situations and broken circumstances and broken homes. But I'm telling you right now, you keep preaching and you keep loving on them. and You keep speaking the word and you keep saying, I'm sending my angels into those homes to let them know I am your eyewitness. I'm watching you. So number one, we see that he's our eyewitness. Number two, that he never tells us to do something that he hasn't done. 
God never tells us to do something that he hasn't already done. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? I want you to think about it like this. He is my eyewitness, therefore I witness. He's my eyewitness, therefore I witness. He's the most valid eyewitness. He's seeing things that we cannot see. He, he gives this to us so that we can be just like him. God says, I, I so love the world that I gave. I gave my one and only son. Why? So that you can be reconnected back to me, so that you can have a relationship with me, so that you can be adopted into my family. I witness what I need to see in you. And so now, because he is our witness, Therefore, now I witness. He says, I saw it all the way back in the Garden of Eden, what was needed to be seen. <laughs> do you understand that God, do you, do you even know that this, this coronavirus, that God already saw this? He knew that it was coming. He knew that it was, it, he knew that this was going to ravish the earth. <sighs> Beloved, there's nothing that is escaping the watchful eye of God, and there's a purpose in it. Even though we may not see it right now, we may not understand it right now, but God is revealing to those of us who are strong enough to press into his presence, to allow him to show us what we need to see so we can see what he sees. He saw all the way back in the Garden of Eden what needed to be seen. He saw, let me tell you what God saw. God saw what the enemy did to gullible Adam and Eve and what the enemy is going to try to do us when he limited their eyesight to only what was physical. We preached about this months ago. I would suggest that you go through the archives and get one of those messages because uh, it's pretty powerful and it's all about eyesight and it's all about what God wants us to see. And we talked about how, wasn't it very interesting that when the enemy came to Eve in the garden, he says, eat this because if you eat it, your eyes will be opened. And their eyes were already open. Their spiritual eyes were already open. So really, in fact, what he was saying, he was telling them that their eyes would be open. But really what was happening is that there was a particular spiritual vision that had been shut down as a result of them eating. And the only thing that remained open was their physical eyes. Because remember, there were certain things that they couldn't even see. It wasn't until God came into the garden and he asked Adam, where have you been? Why have you been? And, and Adam says, I was hiding. And God says, why? And he says, because I was naked. And the Lord says to him, who told you that? That means that before, before they ate of the fruit, they did not even see that they have physical nakedness. Because their spiritual eyes were so much greater and their spiritual understanding of what God had called them to do was so much greater than what they saw physically that once their spiritual eyesight had been shut down, only thing that was left was their physical eyes and all of a sudden now they're aware of things that they were never aware of before. And God saw it all. He knew that their vision that their eyesight was going to be limited. And so he created a plan all the way back then where he says that I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. He already prophesied to the enemy right then and there that Jesus is coming and he's going to reopen the spiritual eyes of all of those who say yes to him so that the spiritual eyesight that you need to have, the spiritual eyesight that you need in order to survive will be so much far greater than the physical eyesight that the enemy has left you with. So what's he asking? He's asking us to adjust. He's asking us to adjust our vision so that we won't simply rely on our physical eyesight, but we will rely upon what God is saying in the spirit. Jesus, just like I got to put these glasses on to adjust my vision so that I can see properly what God wants me to see. God is saying, I want you to see the beauty that I've made in you. I want you to see the purpose that I've designed in you. I know you intimately. I know you perfectly. I know you purposefully every single hair on your head and even though you may be sitting in a place where you're saying God I don't even know who I am God saying it don't matter because I know you I see you I formed you in my image and I have plans and I have a design for you so here we come to our key verse that Paul says to Timothy in chapter 2 look at this 
Let's read it one more time. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What is Paul saying? First, he says to him, he says, number one, I want you to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I want you to be strong in the grace that is Christ Jesus. Not strong in your own strength, not strong in your own might, not strong because you've been lifting weights, not strong because you think you're so high and mighty. I want you to be strong in grace. The grace that is in Christ Jesus. I remember my daughter was little. Um, I, I, she, she went to the, she went to an elementary school that she could walk to, and there was a path that led from one street, and it was a path that you walked up some stairs, and it was in between two houses, and it was this little path that they created. I don't know, probably some neighbors, and it ended you right in the back parking lot of the elementary school, but it was definitely a path. It was brook, uh, brush and, and trees and leaves and rocks and dirt. And it, it, if, you, if you were little, you, it, was, it was pretty scary. It was pretty scary to kind of navigate on your own. Now we could have gone on the regular road and walked and it would have taken us an extra 10 minutes to go all the way around, all the way to the end of the street, take a right, go all the way up and then get to the front of the school and then come to the back parking lot where the kids lined up. Or we could just at this street right here, just go up this path and go through that, through the forest and through the woods to the school. And I remember so many times walking her on this path and so many times wanting to just take her to where the path began, where the stairs go up, and she would grab my hand, like, come on, Ma, can't do it on my own. And I'd walk her on up the path. She didn't need to have her own strength because she had me as her strength. She had me as her, as her provider, as her supporter, as her protector. And I would walk her up those stairs. I'd get her all the way up to, to that place where the parking lot would open up. And I'd say, okay, Maya, have a good day. And she'd run off and go stand in the line with the rest of her school. And every day we'd get up and I'd look at her and I would say, we, we doing, we're doing this. And she, she, we'd get there and, I'd, and she'd grab my hand. And, I, and, and for as long as, I, as she needed me, I'd walk up that path. Then one day, I walked to that path and I got there and I was waiting for her to reach her hand out. And she was like, she looked back at me and she says, I got this. She walked on up that path and she started singing her little song about God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. And she, she didn't tell me that until later on. She told me when she came back from school, she said, Mom, I sang it. Next thing I know, next day I get up, I'm like, Maya, she's like, Mom, you stay in the bed. I'm walking to school on my own today. And this is what Paul is saying to, Pete, to, to Timothy. He say, listen, I, the, the grace that is in Christ Jesus is what is your strength. And he's like, and I'm not telling you something I don't already know. Because Paul says it in another phrase, verse where he says that his grace is sufficient for me. For his power is made perfect in my what? In my weakness. So that's why we, when he's weak, he can say, I'm strong. Because no matter, you're going to get to that place, you're going to get to that path, and, and the Lord is just waiting. He's like, my hand is right here. You're not doing this on your own. You don't, you don't have to be a witness on your own. I'm not going to tell you to do something that I haven't already done. I've gone before you. I'm your defender. I'm, I'm going to come from behind. I'm going to hem you in the front. I'm going to make sure you get to where you go. I have your future in my mind. Do you think I'm going to let the enemy destroy you? Do you think the enemy can do whatever he wants with you? No, no, no. You belong to me. And so Paul says to Timothy, he says, I want you to be strong in the grace that is Christ Jesus. Eyewitness because he was my eyewitness. 
It is grace. It is that supernatural ability that comes upon the believer that causes you to know that you can do something that you couldn't do in your own strength, that you could be something that you could never be in your own strength. I don't know about you, but I, I had to come to a place in my life where, especially, especially for those of us who grew up in the church, I don't know why it just becomes so hard for us, for those of us who are, who are uh, church kids, I call us, because we, um, we know all and we've seen all and we've seen, <laughs> we've seen all the ins and outs, the ups and the downs. And so as a result of that, sometimes our relationship with God is based on what we've seen and what we've been around. It's not always based on what we know in our knower. And it wasn't until I was 23 years old when I had to come to myself and say, Lord, if you don't do it in my life, if I can't walk in your grace and in your power, if, if you don't do it in my life, if I, I had to say, Lord, I'm weak. I'm not, I can't pretend any longer. I can't keep putting on the front. I can't keep acting like I'm strong when I know that I am weak. So it's when I'm in my weakness, that's where your strength, your grace comes in and it allows me to go on to be something that I could never be, to have something I could never have, to say no to things I could have never said no to. I could keep worrying about it and I could keep talking about it or I could just say, Lord, thank you for being my eyewitness. You saw what needed to be seen in my life, even when I couldn't see it. So that supernatural grace comes upon you to help you to walk the ways that God always ordained for you to walk. So number one, that he says to him, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then he says this interesting verse, and this is the key for all of us who are eyewitnesses. He says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is what he says. He says, as you walk in this strength, hear me church, hear me young people, hear me old people, hear me middle-aged people, hear me everyone who is listening around the globe. Paul says, as you walk in this strength, Take what you've heard from, from me and pass it on to reliable, faithful men. I was sent, this is what Paul's saying, I was sent by God to see what was inside of you. I was sent by God. I can't even tell you how much this is happening in my own life right now where God is just sending people. He's sending me, sending me, sending me. And he's telling me, tell them what I see about them. Tell them what I see in them. Tell, some of them, are, some of them have, have even said to me, PT, my, my nickname, what do you, I don't even know. Why, why, do you, why do you see? Why do you see me? And I'm like, I don't see you. It's God who sees you. God knows. God has a plan. God has an ordination. God has a commissioning for who you are supposed to be. And Paul, even though he got beat down and even though he was left for dead, the father said, go back and lay hands and fan into flames the gift that is in a young man. His name is Timothy. He has a legacy from his mother and his grandmother. And so Paul says, what I did for you how I was sent by God to see you, now I want you to see others. I want you to train others. I want you to teach others. I want you to adjust your vision so that you line up with what God sees. I want you to see in others what I saw in you. I want you to go train and to pour into others what I poured into you when I sent Paul to minister the words of life and to lay hands on you and to encourage you not to be afraid. Not to have the spirit of fear, but to have power and love in a sound mind. Now, everything I did to you, I used to say to my youth years ago, they would, they would say to me, Pastor Teresa, how can we thank you? How can we thank you? How can we, for all, I said, you can never thank me. All I expect out of you is for you to pay it forward. Take what you've learned and what's been implanted in you and turn around and give it to others. Now, with that method Go forward and teach others, train others. Don't judge, don't condemn, don't, don't blame, don't browbeat, 
don't speak about all their failures and all their past. I don't need to tell you that you're a half breed. You already know because God is saying, I'm not focused on your past. I'm preparing you for the future. So the things you heard from me, the ways that I've loved you, Paul so much, he loved him so much that he ended up getting into an argument uh, and, and he decides, I'm going to take Timothy. I'm going to take Timothy to go. You know that message that Pastor Joe preached a, a couple of months ago where he preached about the, um, the time when Paul and, and Silas ended up getting, being thrown into prison? Do you know that Timothy was with them on that journey? That P Timothy became, oh, he became glued to Paul like a sidekick. He, he probably didn't even know what it was that God was preparing in him, but he became one of the most prolific and most incredible evangelists and preachers of his time. Why? Because Paul saw in him what God saw in him. He says, now be a witness to what I have done in your life so that others will be attracted to a life lived with the Father. Would you bow your heads with me today? I want you to understand what God sees in you. I want you to receive what God sees in you. Some of you, just like the, the son in, in, in the book of Luke, where you, you've decided, I'm going to come back, but when I come back, I'm going to tell, tell my father, I just want to be a slave. Just make me a servant. And the father is saying, no, 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 no. You're not a servant. You're not a slave. You're a son. You're a daughter. And what I see in you, I need you to see. I witness because he is my eyewitness. So would you lift your hands with me today? And would you pray this simple prayer? Would you pray, Father, help me to see what you see in me. Help me to make the adjustments. That's what vision is. 2020 vision is being able to see perfectly what it is that God sees. Eyewitnesses make mistakes all the time. They don't see what they're supposed to see. But God, you see perfectly. You see masterfully. You know who I am and who you created me to be. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And so God, right now, I'm asking you to shift my vision, to shift my eyesight, to shift what I see so that I can see myself the way that you see me, so that I can begin to operate as a son and as a daughter. I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that he died on the cross and that he rose from the dead so that I could be adopted into the family of God. I thank you right now that you have adopted me, that you've bought me with a price, and that you had a plan set in place long ago so that I would be your own. And so today, I received that adoption into your family so that I could walk and live and operate, not as a slave, not as an orphan, not as a servant, but as one who is a member of the household of God. I receive that right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of us together say amen. I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us today, for being a part of this Easter celebration. I pray God's blessings on you and your household, that you'll be safe and healthy and whole. Until we meet again, I'll be praying for you as you will be praying for me. God bless you.